Thank you so much, choir. I honestly don't know how to, I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> that was amazing. It was really, really good. Um, for those of you who thought that the song was Ain't No Mountain High Enough, I apologize. <laughs> uh, though that would have been, that would have been quite something, I think. Uh, I will not be singing Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Uh, but that is the title of my sermon, Ain't No Mountain. And it is on purpose. That is from that song. Uh, I bring you greetings from the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, from Global Missions, and from everyone working in Together for Hope communities and in the rural Americas. I bring you greetings because those are the, the people that I work with. Uh, my name is Stephanie Vance. I live in Athens, Alabama, not Athens, Georgia. I know y'all get this a lot too, right? Uh, I say I live in Athens, Alabama, and they'll say, Athens, Georgia, that's close to Atlanta. No, I live in Athens, Alabama. You live in Jacksonville? Oh, Jacksonville, Florida is a beautiful place. You know, it is. It really is. So is Jacksonville, Alabama. You should come visit sometime, right? And so, so we get this sort of thing when we live in rural communities um, where we, we have this sort of um, identity issue where we'll say, I live here, but it's, it's kind of close to here, but also not kind of close to here, right? Um, or you can get there from here, but you can't get there from here, right? Uh, I started working with Together for Hope back in 2010 as the Together for Hope missionary in Louisiana. I worked and lived there for three years. And uh, I was the first person on the ground in East Carroll Parish doing that particular work. It was not easy work because I was... They called me that crazy liberal girl from Alabama uh, because I said things like breaking the cycle of generational poverty and uh, wouldn't it be awesome if we all worked together on this? White folks and African American folks, how about we sit at a table together? So that, that labeled me as that crazy liberal girl from Alabama. And I was always going to be that crazy liberal girl from Alabama, so I just, I welcomed it and lived there for three years as that girl, you know. Missionary. They called me missionary, those who didn't know my name. I'd walk down the street and they'd say, missionary! Hey, missionary, when is that meeting going to be? Um, it's, it's Stephanie, and the meeting is going to be tomorrow night at such and such time. When I first moved to the community, I started trying to get to know people, and I met a lady named Eloise, Eloise Edwards. And the next day, I met a lady named Eloise McKenzie. And I said, oh, this is crazy. I just met an Eloise yesterday. And she said, which one, Edwards or Howard? And I thought, oh, this is a small town, right? And it was the idea, I had, I had grown up in Madison, Alabama, which when I was growing up was small, it was about 10,000 people maybe. And now it's about 50,000 people, it's not small. It's a city, it's got its own school system, it's its own sort of insular community. It's one of the best places to raise your kids according to several different magazines in the, in the US. But it was not that way when I was growing up. It was just a dying cotton town when I was growing up. Uh, but I never understood that small of a place until I moved to Lake Providence, Louisiana. And, and then it was just like, oh, which one, Howard or Edwards? Oh, it was Edwards. Oh, okay, I guess I'll need to meet her, Miss, Miss Eloise Howard to know them all. Well, a year later, I met Eloise Howard and I knew all the Eloises in town. Uh, but it's that, that small town feel. It's that understanding of living sort of what people call in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but because we do asset-based work in, in uh, community, asset-based community development, I don't like to use that sort of negative thought. And so I call it living in the middle of somewhere. Because everybody's, no, everybody's nowhere is somebody somewhere. 
so even if somebody calls this the middle of nowhere or calls that the middle of nowhere, it's still somebody somewhere. So uh, that's what I do. I do a lot of work in the middle of somewhere, manage a lot of work in the middle of somewhere in North America, Latin America, and uh, a couple places in Haiti. And so that's my, my new work uh, at, that I've just been commissioned to do last month, almost, almost two months ago, I guess. But yeah, a full month ago, I was commissioned uh, to do this work. And, uh, and it's an amazing ride uh, so far, but you are my first church that I will speak at as a commissioned CBF field person. So I will never forget speaking here, even though I've been wanting to come here for a long time, right? So I would have never forgotten it anyway, but this is a special day because you're my first CBF field personnel speaking church, right? So I better do good. So let's look at the scripture for today. We're going to be in uh, Romans chapter eight, chapter eight, and um, starting in verses twenty verses verse twenty seven. Oh wait, did I say twenty seven? Yeah, I did say twenty seven. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. God, as we gather together today, as we seek your will in the hearing of these words, as we look toward our community and what we can do in, in our community and others, as we seek out those who feel separated from your love, Lord, be with us as we hear, as we open our eyes and our ears, as we talk to one another about what this means. Lord, be with me as I bring this message. Help me to only really bring what you tell me to do. Help this congregation, Lord, as we come together to worship you as we listen to your word, as we see you in the faces around us, as we hear you in the voices of the choir. 
be with us, guide us and direct us. For it's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. So, it's a pretty amazing passage. I mean, you have to, you have to, you know, I mean, you have to admit this is a really amazing passage. The very first, the verse right before this passage begins says that the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Paul, Paul is writing, he's writing his heart out to the Romans. Um, and to kind of understand where this is coming from, Paul's letter to the Romans is really sort of preaching to the choir. Paul is writing to the Romans. This is a church he's always wanted to come to since it began, right? This is a church that's established. He's really excited about visiting them sometime. Hopefully, someday I'll come see you, right? He says in his greeting. And say hi to such and such and such and such and such and such as he starts every letter, right? There's this sort of gushiness of... I can't believe you, you guys exist. It's so exciting, right, to be in the world as a church, right? So that's kind of how Paul is, is, is talking to the Romans. And then normally in the formula of the Pauline letters, we have um, this moment where he says, you guys are doing great. You, you're doing some good stuff in the world. However, right, however, I've heard tell of some things going on we got to have some words, right? So that's usually the formula of the Pauline letters. This is not the formula of Romans. Romans is, uh, like I said, preaching to the choir. He, he kind of praises them for being who they are, says he can't wait to see them, and then he starts kind of laying out what he believes and, um, and what he thinks uh, God is telling him to say to the Romans and it's more of a discipleship book than it is anything else. It's just a sort of laying out these, these really important things to know, right? But, but even just in the chapter right before this, it's almost like this is a confessor church for him as well. Because right before this, he says um, in chapter 7, I don't do the things I'm supposed to, and I do the things I'm not supposed to. What can save me from this wishy-washy thing, right? And then he says, only Jesus Christ can. So, so even, that, even then he's sort of confessing, this is what's going on with me, you know. And then he comes to chapter 8. And, and I think there's a reason why we, why we get the Romans road from Romans. <laughs> because, because he's giving them sort of the tools to make more disciples, these are disciples making more disciples, right? Um, he's, not, he's not speaking to people who need to be disciples. He's speaking to people who are disciples trying to make more, right? So he's giving them sort of this, this sort of uh, interstate system, if you will. And so we come to this passage here where he, uh, he says what I think is one of the most important things that he can say to any congregation and what I think that uh, generationally means just as much to us now as it did 2,000 years ago when he said it to the Romans. Um, what can separate us from the love of God? Uh, and so when I was thinking about this this week, uh, as I do, I just sort of... Um, read scripture and I kind of read it over and over and then I just sort of think about it for a while and I mean not to give you my whole preaching process or anything I don't want to I don't want y'all to be able to steal it <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but like I you know I sort of ruminate on it you know sort of let it marinate a little bit you know and then I kind of go back to it and see what What's kind of risen really for me in the in the reading of it and the sort of thinking about it, and I read some commentaries about it. I read what other people have said about it, and um, and you know what came to me was, ain't no mountain high enough, right? 
So that song, uh, who's familiar with the song, Ain't No Mountain High Enough? Thank goodness, <laughs> right? Because this would be a total flop if nobody knew what song. <laughs> so the song really, if you think about the lyrics of that song, it's really about a, a, the singer who has given up a love, this let this love go, but if any time, if at any time that love still needs the singer for any reason, for any help, all you have to do is call me and I'll be there because there ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you, babe, right? <laughs> <clears throat> you got to end the, I mean, you can't just say that one without, without the last part. I think, I think that God says this to us. There is no mountain high enough. There is no valley low enough. There is no river wide enough to keep God's love from being with you at all times. I think that's what he's saying here. I think that's the gist of it. Uh, but I want to kind of get into a couple of these things that he says really quickly. I do have a timer. I mean, I've got sort of, you know, my Fitbit's keeping me and, you know, I've, I'm keeping it all together, hopefully. And then I'll get a nod from Chris, hopefully. <laughs> So, so Paul says here um, in verse uh, 31, he says, if God is for us, who is against us? In other words, if we've got God, no matter what the world throws at us, matters not, right? It is, not, it is nothing to the love of God, right? It doesn't say, if God is for us, then nothing, ever ba nothing bad will happen. Uh, and in fact, um, right after this it says, or right before this it says, for, uh, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. A better translation of this really is to say, because of how the Greek works, and I know this is getting a little bit Greeky, but um, is is to say that God is working all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Not that all things are working towards good, because we know that life circumstances don't work toward us, to, you know, to help us a lot of times. Um, I, uh, when I was living in, in uh, Louisiana, I had this moment where I, I made it. I made a, a bad decision. I used a ladder improperly. Don't ever do that, ever. If it's an A-frame ladder, you use it like an A. Never use it where it doesn't look like an A, okay, everybody? An A-frame ladder should look like an A to be used, right? Don't close it and lean it against something. So I did that, and it fell, and I held on. So I had this sort of split-second decision. Do I hold on or do I jump off? And I'm painting at the 10-foot ceiling in my kitchen. So I think, well, I'm holding on. You know. So I held on, and I hurt both of my knees pretty badly. Um, I had multiple problems with my knees. I had full-blown ACL tear, uh, torn my men meniscus in both knees, and one of my kneecaps was not in the right place. It was not a good decision, right? I was there as a missionary, doing good for God, right? The circumstances were not working to my favor. I, I made a bad decision, sure, but surely, if I'm there for God, then God would protect me from that moment, right? No, that's not how this, is wor that's not how this works, right? But it does work toward good. 
right? So in that long period of, of adjustment from being able to walk correctly to having a full year of recovery and surgeries and uh, learning how to do something, do something I'd done for my whole life in a, in a pain-free way again. I learned that communities come together to help those who have fallen. I learned that uh, if my mom finds out that I've fallen from a ladder and it's seven hours away from where she lives, she's going to get in a car and she's going to drive to me. My dad, my dad too. He was there with me. So, so they came. They immediately got in the car. They drove to me. They helped me. My dad stayed with me for a month until I could do some of the things I needed to do. But I lived in a small town, so they didn't diagnose me well. Told me I had sprained knees. And uh, it was a smaller, much smaller place. And, it, you know, the hospital had like two people in it, every, you know, one or two people in it a night. I mean, it was, not, it was a tiny hospital. But what I learned was that God was in that moment, that God was with me in that t in, during that time and throughout that time and in the people who worked with me and walked alongside me and helped me to walk alongside them. That that, that is sometimes how God is with us in these times that don't feel like anything's working toward the good, right? So those things weren't working toward the good, but God was working those things toward the good. They're fine now, see? <laughs> They're good, yeah. But do not use an A-frame ladder the wrong way. If you learn anything today, right? But, but Paul says in this, that there are, there, there are a lot of things to be afraid of in the world, right? He lists, in total, 17 different things. But he's prefaced it by saying, what can be, you know, what can be against us, right? Just to kind of help us not be afraid of them, right, a little bit. But he said, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Is it circumstances in our life? Is it war? Is it famine? Is it the loss of a job? Is it the loss of health? What is it? Can any of those things remove us from the love of God? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. And then he says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, and he kind of juxtaposes a couple things, you know, death nor life, angels nor rulers, which angels meaning the, the um, heavenly forces who oppose God and then the rulers on earth who do the same. nor things present, nor things to come. There's, there's a lot of speculation among scholars about why Paul didn't say things past, nor things present, nor things to come. And, uh, and I think it's because this was first century Rome and first century, uh, this is the first century world. They all knew that the past affected everything, right? This is the culture. The culture was the past is going to affect you for generations to come. So that was a given that the past would be something to fear. Uh, but we all know that the past affects us. But the past does not separate us from the love of God either. Present, nor things to come, nor powers. And then this is where, of course, the mountains and the valleys came from. The height, nor depth. And then my absolute favorite, nor anything else in all creation. Just in case 
He didn't cover something that you could fear or worry about in any of this description. Nor anything else in all creation. Um, we work in some of the hardest places to work in the U.S. And I know that you know, that you know this because... Your church has been involved in Together for Hope work over the years, and you've been to Sowing Seeds of Hope, and you've been to Willacy County, is that right? Well, Texas. Yeah, in the valley. You've been to the Rio Grande Valley. I call them by their counties. But you've been to like Harlingen and Laferia, areas like that. So you've seen the, the colonias along the border uh, you've seen, uh, you've worked in Marion. Uh, you know that there are places where people feel somehow separated from notice of government, from, uh, they feel separated from the world. They feel like their lives don't matter to anyone. And this is where this passage means something more because when you put your hands and feet into this work and when you walk alongside people in Together for Hope communities and when you walk alongside people in any of the work that you do in your community, you're letting them know nothing will separate anyone who believes from the love of God. You are the hands and feet, right? And so as you, as you continue to uh, work and, and strive to be the community that loves uh, those around you, keep these words in, in mind. You know, you're doing, you're doing the, the good work, the good kingdom work of reminding people that God still loves them. Uh, even if everyone else has forgotten that they are there, uh, that you will never forget, uh, and that and that to me is is one of the one of the most important things about the work of of Together for Hope in the world uh, is that we're walking alongside folks, we're partnering with them in their community to create change, but the main thing is that we're there with them and that we have folks like y'all who want to partner and walk alongside them as well and get to know who they are, not just come for a few days and leave, but you're gonna come back, right? It's the idea of, of continuing that work. If we, we are to do a long-term work, we have to con keep coming back. Um, because they're used to people coming and saying they'll stay and then leaving. Uh, and so, so that's the difference, is, is that we, if we are saying we're going to come and stay and stay, uh, then maybe this message comes across a little differently. Maybe people begin to understand a little bit more about how God loves them even when no one else really knows them. Um, so that's my word for you about Romans 8. I thank you so much for the work that you do in Together for Hope Communities, and I thank you so much for the work that you do in your community. Uh, and I challenge you to continue that work and to Think about what that work means to every person that you walk alongside. Um, because every person you walk alongside wants to be known. Um, and, and each one of those folks might be asking, am I separated from the love of God? And friends, you've got the answer. Uh, and so be that answer. Thank you. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for 
everyone here in this congregation for their willingness to serve you, for their willingness to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. I pray that you will continue to bless the work that they do, that you'll continue to help them uh, vision what is next. Lord, be with all of us as we uh, go about your work in the world, as we go about your kingdom work. For it's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.